Hello, Mioni here, and welcome to my summary of Letter from a Producer Live, Part 80, that aired today, the 13th of April, 2024. In this video, we are actually using the unofficial subreddit Discord for Final Fantasy XIV. Of course, that Discord link will be provided in the description. Go and support the lovely team over there. Their translations allow for videos like this on YouTube from many content creators, myself included, to be possible in the first place. Let's talk about the live letter then and the 14-hour broadcast at the start. The festivities begin for this 14-hour broadcast with Yoshi P joined by none other than Zodalin, which is obviously Foxclon in his amazing cosplay here. Yoshi P finds a green blanket to become invisible on their new set here with their green screen background that they use to show scenes from a game behind them to liven things up a bit. As you can tell, this is a time of celebration for the Square Enix team as they're just about to release Dawn Trail and it's nice to see the staff having some fun. So there was a 10 hour tabletop RPG stream as well on a second stream that we're not going to be looking at that features the upcoming uh, tabletop RPG that's releasing in May that you can purchase. Uh, that looks awesome. I can't wait to play it myself and we'll have videos on that in the future. So letter from a producer live number 80 starts with the unveiling of the benchmark trailer. This is what you will see if you download the benchmark yourself to test the game's performance on your own PC. Featuring sneak peeks at many new job abilities, the zones, sneak peeks at some of the music, it's frankly brilliant and everything that I wanted. Definitely go and click in the description of this video and go and watch the link to the trailer itself. The video is available on the official Final Fantasy XIV YouTube channel, but you can of course download the benchmark yourself if you're a PC player on the Sunday, in fact, uh, on the 14th, April the 14th, uh, at 12 a.m. Pacific time, I believe they said. So that's pretty hype. You'll be able to go and look at that yourself, and I'm sure many people will be breaking down scene by scene to see what the new job abilities look like. The start of the live letter begins with a review and a little recap of Dawn Trail, obviously talking about the fact that early access will begin on Friday the 28th of June, and the official launch for Dawn Trail itself is on the 2nd of July, the following Tuesday. They say if you pre-order the game, you can get the, the uh, wind-up Zidane minion and the Azamer's earrings, which provide an EXP boost up to level 90 for your combat classes and jobs in the game. Definitely pre-order the game if you can. There are different versions of the expansion you can buy, all dependent on what platform you play, which they show this useful chart that shows you what you get with each version. The Collector's Edition physical box contains a Viper figurine, a cloth map, the Unending Journey Journal, which is blank so you can write in your own journal entries, an Adventurer's pen case, and a special art box with that beautiful Amano artwork. The Collector's Edition digital items include the upcoming Arc Mount, the Wind-Up Garnet Minion, and the Chocobo Brush Glamour Weapon for the upcoming Pictomancer job, also releasing with Dawn Trail. Very excited to see what Pictomancer looks like, and that looks like a cool-looking weapon. And now for the main content then, the reason you tuned in. The first half of the stream focuses a lot on in-game footage, complete with technical terms about the graphical updates. There'll be side-by-side -side comparisons, with 6.58 being used as one of the examples, and also 7.0 on the other screen, as Yoshi P and Foxclon are in the game at the same time on Yoshi P's account on different versions. So for these side-by-side -side live comparisons, with Foxclon playing. This is the Elpis zone. They use this as an example of the foliage and texture differences between the two versions. Amongst many other texture changes you can see in here, the grass is very much front and center. They say Elpis is an area where they've put a lot of effort into it. Yoshi P comments how the grass looks so much more detailed and the hair of his character as well. Seeing it like this is incredibly obvious to me to see what differences the graphical update can bring to just anywhere in the game. Bear in mind all of these foliage changes apply retroactively to anywhere that you've been, be it an open area or a dungeon instance. It's going to be quite interesting, actually. So when walking, you'll see how through this foliage, the grass is actually moving around the character in the 7.0 version. This is a new piece of tech that they're using compared to the, obviously on the left there, unmoving old foliage, which is just, it's night and day, isn't it? 
we're going to overuse that statement. Next, they show mounting and flying. So mounts have had a complete animation overhaul depending on what mount it is. The mounts actually now tilt a little compared to the original if that is enabled. Not every single mount will have this enabled, but in the case of this Griffin mount, as you can see, comparatively uh, on the left side, it's more sort of jagged, like 90 degree turns as you move. But on the right side in 7.0 onwards, you'll see the Griffin is actually tilting and floating around because it's got its wings and that's how it would look much more fluid. Very cool stuff. So yeah, just to reiterate, they didn't change the values for mounts that would look weird if they were tilted. So don't expect this to be forced onto every mount, but they want you to go into the game and see for yourself which ones have changed. Again, the, the foliage in this is just, it's incredible, isn't it? The backdrop, it looks a lot higher uh, res as well. For a content creator, I'm looking at this and going, wow, the bit rate's handling this really well comparatively to the footage on the left. That's the thing with streaming or recording Final Fantasy XIV. It's very hard to sort of get foliage in the scene without it looking blurry and horrible. So you can see that there's quite a lot of features that we'll talk about later in this video that have added to that. Yoshi P wants to show us a comparison of ground textures, zoom in if you will, of the floor. These are in Tail Feather, a zone in Heavensward if you remember it. As you can see the textures are just unbelievably so much more detailed. Yoshi P says the further you zoom in the more it makes you want to stop on Foxclon's side, indicating obviously the 6.58 version in comparison. You also get a really good look at the hair on the top of Yoshi P's character here. My goodness, that looks incredible, doesn't it, each and every strand. The etherite side by side now. As you can see, he says, the shaders on the etherite are also improved, end quote, as they g-pose this uh, shot side by side here with the g-pose function. It's hard to believe, looking at this on the, the right, that the game actually looks currently like the left side to me, as someone watching this stream. This is definitely going to be something many of us love, but immediately forget how it used to be, kind of how how people have forgotten what the PS3 graphics look like or 1.0 graphics. It looks so good, doesn't it? Now we'll look at water and wetness of clothing in particular. So here you can see in Thavnir, a side by side of the Pantheon gear from the Myths of Realm Alliance raid on Yoshi P's character. You can see the eyes and other facial changes on his character much more uh, obviously up close and personal here. There are also showing the wetness on the glamour here in G-Pose using the show wetness function side by side, showing the shine compared to the original. This applies to obviously the face as well as the clothes, so it looks a lot more wet and shiny. Full texture updates, Yoshi P says the character looks more lively as a result of this, so I have to agree honestly, it really does, it looks just night and day what else can you say rain and weather then so a good example of weather effects they go to amdapur keep dungeon which looks incredible the texture changes here are very noticeable spider webs that actually look like silky spider web sort of texture bark on trees that don't look as blurry this is incredible to me the wet stone here also reflecting all of that environment this is not even a new dungeon and this is pretty massive it's like a natural glow up of a pretty old instance of the game. Remember when this came out. Uh, imagine what new dungeons will look like then, with all of the stuff being built from the ground up with the new textures. Holy moly, I can't wait. Yoshi P says, we've improved and changed the textures for every field from every expansion. So when you're done with your new adventures, please take some time to go back. We didn't finish every gear piece yet, but we'll keep working on those. Gear will also reflect the environment better. If the skies were blue here, he says, there would be a tint of blue on your gear. We also have more polygons for fingers and toes as well now, end quote. Which is really cool, it shows you that they're listening to what people want and trying to future-proof their characters. Now we change zone to Il Meg, which is obviously in Shadowbringers. The textures on the floor, the stones, the grass and weeds growing between them there. Everything here is so vastly different to my eyes. The lush pink fields are now way more vibrant and detailed, and that comparison is frankly ridiculous. Look at that. The detail per flower is just so much higher, per petal even. As you walk through the flowers, they indeed move, much like the grass, so little petals are flying off as well as Yoshi P jumps up and down in them. 
and pushes forward through them. It just feels so much more immersive. I want to walk through that myself compared to the left side, which is just so static, isn't it? And you can see the floor much easier. So I think it's uh, definitely the density of these areas is going to look very impressive, especially since we're seeing jungles in Dawn Trail. So the fog off of the lake is another demonstration of other environmental effects they can now use to add some mysticism and, you know, some backdrop and depth to zones, which looks really cool. So you can imagine what they can do with creepy places. So now we're just going to show only the 7.0 stuff. Uh, so they talk about anti-aliasing and Yoshi P says the closer that you look at an object the more pixelated it will seem But with the rendering methods that they have it will be shown smoothly Maybe you can notice how the leaves of a tree in the background are shaking a little he says So as you can see the, the, it's shaking a little bit the smaller an object like a leaf the more noticeable the shaking will be They now have two rendering methods in the game showing TSCMAA, which isn't that noticeable on the footage on what from what I could see, you know, especially through compression on YouTube, etc. But you do actually notice on TSC MMA, uh, MAA mode rather, there is less jumping around of those textures. There's also a TSC MAA mode, but as the jittering camera enabled as well, if you wanted that, but I think it looks terrible in comparison after seeing night and day comparisons. This looks like they have a much better anti-aliasing package bringing to 14. And um, yeah, it, it looks so much better than FXAA in my opinion. It's probably gonna be more noticeable when you actually look at it in the game. And hopefully the benchmark, we can show some comparisons of that as well. Next, talking about shadows, which is a big thing in MMORPGs and any game these days. The first option is the soft shadow option. As you can see, on the trees, shadow quality is improved and more detailed on the floor, so you can see the outlines. The parameters for soft shadows mean that the higher up you go, the softer they actually start to look, as you can see here. The closer an object is, and the shadow is closer to your eyes, the more firm and you know distinctive those lines are. The leaves are obviously further away, so they naturally blur out a little bit more which is closer to how real life would go. So that's the new feature. This is a setting and you can turn this off if you wanted it to just be permanently detailed. But as you could see, even far away, being that defined, it kind of loses that sort of middle ground. So having that sort of variable setting, having the soft shadows on adds a lot more depth, I think, at least to my eyes, but it's an option you can turn on and off. This is only something you can change on Windows and Mac, however, with PS5 having the highest setting enabled by default, so bear that in mind, you'll have the soft shadows permanently. So system config, uh, graphic settings, and depending on the platform you play, the settings and options may vary, obviously. This applies to every shadow you're seeing in the entire game, he says, so that's pretty awesome. So if it's a shadow of your character, or a boss, or a plimp for an etherite they'll all be affected the same way so now limited to a few places in the game they say there are some new water effects this demonstrates a new tech they're employing allowing the team to better display waves and water physics where is this you ask if i turn the camera a bit the scenario team will be very mad at me he laughs and obviously this is somewhere in solution 9 presumably as you can kind of guess but uh, yeah, that, that looks like very choppy, stormy, stormy seas. I like the lightning bolts as well, flashing in the background. That looks really cool. Next, we have a shot of Camp Drybone over in Fanalan in the starting area, uh, showing the NPCs that have been updated here and the landscape. So, you know, some NPCs do get backdated, including these. You'll notice the eyes are actually moving, Yoshi P says. This might influence cutscenes and how characters show emotions, so it's actually turned off during those. Same goes for G-Pose. This is just a little detail we liked, uh, like to add, and it only happens during your normal gameplay. Do we need it? Probably not. Did we want it? Most definitely, he laughs, end quote. So all of the little details go towards enriching the bigger picture of the world and, you know, that world building, the story building. So apparently the team worked very hard to bring more of that world alive with little bits like this, as you can clearly see. And I really like the fact that NPCs can blink and their pupils can move. That's something I, I don't want to go back from, honestly, after seeing it. So next, um... Yoshi P wants to show Tulialal. So this is actually the main city 
in Dawn Trail. This is what it actually looks like and where the expansion presumably begins. And the Yoshi P turns off repeatedly in this footage, uh, as you could see, trying not to spoil too much. I think, honestly, they showed too much here, but they, they just wanted to show as much as possible. They're very proud of what they've, you know, actually done here. And Yoshi P says a lot of work went into this. So, and you can really tell, can't you? It's very magical. They also uh, toggle nighttime as well. You can see all those lanterns turn on. Incredible stuff. Absolutely magical. And then there's a view from the top of the city where Yoshi P says, and I quote, a place you can get to if you try really hard, end quote. So yes, this is Kagane Tower 2. So jumping puzzles do return if you're a fan of those. I personally cannot wait for there to be an obscure sightseeing location on another lamppost to land on. That's going to be fun. Yoshi P says, the tower over there also looks like you can climb it, end quote. So expect lots of jumping puzzles in various areas, including the cities, which is going to be exciting. And now a close-up of fruit. <laughs> uh dear. A look at the detail on all of these objects. Obviously, the, the small, like, clutter objects have been changed and upgraded. Uh, he says, no more low-poly grapes, end quote, and laughs. Uh, the textures on the barrels, the rope there, the sacks, the textures there on the floor as well. Everything is so much higher res, and of course the grapes are no longer just, you know, low-poly. So, a bit sad there if you're expecting low-poly grapes into Liala, you're going to be disappointed. Another graphical option is graphical upscaling. As you can see, there is FSR and NVIDIA DLSS as well. Yoshi P says, quote, we're using some uh, super techniques to increase performance while we're enhancing the graphics, end quote. And then they move to slides to explain this. So super resolution will be implemented on every platform. This is a feature that restores the image quality of low res images, therefore minimizing resolution degradation. So it's actually FSR 1.0, oof, and NVIDIA DLSS 2.0, which isn't too bad. FSR will be enabled by default, and those playing on Windows with a graphics card that supports DLSS 2.0, they recommend changing the resolution settings to that uh, when you can. This has resolution scaling and also enables dynamic resolution when you use these features, which is pretty cool. And obviously, lots of games have this now and people complain when it's not in-game, so there you go. Yoshi P says, so if you have a machine that supports this and want consistent FPS, I recommend keeping this setting on, end quote. For the PS4 and Xbox Series S, both are included in the graphical update, though they do say certain features may not be applicable. To reduce stress on the PS4, super sampling will be reduced, while dynamic resolution and LOD, which is the low detail models on distant objects, will be force enabled. For Xbox, for Series S, uh, to reduce stress, the LOD for shadows will be forcibly enabled. There are also some settings you cannot change on PS4 and Xbox S, but these are the main things they wanted to highlight, um, and obviously these will be on all platforms as well. So uh, yeah, bear in mind that's not all of the changes, but the, these are the main ones that people wanted to know about. Yoshi P says, as previously mentioned, everything we're introducing newly in 7.0 will already have these changes applied, but we didn't get to everything that we have in the game right now. We started with main things like job-specific gear. The 6.0 job gear will get updated graphically in 7.1, except for the Paladin gear, because we use that model data for a lot of testing. As a result, the Paladin gear is already updated, and you can expect that to be in the game. Everyone else gets updated in 7.1 for the 6.0 job gear, just to reiterate what that is. So, moving on to a big segment about blacklisting players, and uh, basically avoiding the nefarious side of Final Fantasy XIV and dealing with it. So, the 7.0 blacklist improvements. Yoshi P says, I don't really like to have too many rules myself. An example would be supported gamepads. I think players should have a freedom to choose their own environment, he says, end quote. So the new improvements include enhanced blacklist functionality, there's now a mute list, a term filter, an estate expulsion feature, and enhanced lodestone privacy settings. So what does all that mean? So as you can see with the blacklist feature, you can now blacklist characters' messages, but also their character model will also be hidden. This will apply to characters tied to the entire service account of that character you have blacklisted. 
Black, uh, blacklisted players do display in certain situations where visibility is necessary, such as when party together in a duty, however. Even when their character model is visible, their name is displayed as simply unknown. Furthermore, a notification will indicate when they try to speak during duties and it will be hidden, and players may elect to temporarily see what they have written in the chat via using a subcommand over that text. Default, it will be hidden if they're blacklisted. The mute list hides a muted character's chat messages, and this is applied to all characters on the muted character service account as well. Their known names will show as normal, but when you're in a party or the same alliance during duties, a notification also pops up to indicate that they've spoken, and you can use the subcommand to see what they said if you so wish to. So if somebody's saying something naughty that they shouldn't, you can see it if you wish to. Or you could leave it blank. Characters blacklist at any time prior to 7.0 will be carried forward, it's backdated. Up to 200 characters can be registered to this blacklist, and data is stored on the server side. This applies across all platforms, but as character names are served, uh, saved on the client side, their names will only display when playing on the device they were registered on. The mute list can store 200 characters, and this limit is not shared with a blacklist, so you can mute people and not blacklist them if you prefer, and obviously that might be an option many people go for for certain situations. This data is stored client-side for the mute list. Characters will only be muted on the device they were initially registered on, that's the other key point. The term filter will filter out messages containing specified terms that you don't want. For example, you might see people gill selling. You could actually censor out that word and it would automatically block that. This applies to say, tell, yell, shout, and emotes in all circumstances in the entire game. It does actually not apply to link shells, crossword link shells, party chat, or free company chat though. So, but just, you know, say, tell, yell, shout, and emotes. So if you're fed up of somebody, you know, spamming some recruitment message or something like that, you can filter terms, which is really cool. It's a shame that wasn't in years ago, honestly. The ex estate expulsion feature allows you to make a list of no entry, uh, so a list of you're not allowed in, whilst within your estate grounds to be expelled immediately. Characters added to this no entry list will be unable to enter your estate for 10 days. This applies to all characters on the expelled character service account as well. So if you expel one person and they make another character, it's still on the same account, so they get turned away and teleported out. Free company masters and estate owners have access to this feature. Masters or estate owners can designate up to four free company members or housemates that you've shared your estate with to have access to this function. And when players with the expulsion privileges are in the estate, anyone registered to their blacklist will be automatically expelled when attempting to enter the estate grounds, which is a really, really nice feature. I like that. In terms of the lodestone privacy settings, these then allow for greater control over what people can see on your lodestone. You can limit who can view certain aspects of your lodestone character page, such as your profile, your achievements, and your friends list. Visibility settings can be limited to your friends, free company members, link shell members, much more. You can also remove yourself from lodestone character searches if you don't want to be searchable by other people. There is also a block list added to the lodestone itself. Notifications regarding the activity and blog entries of blocked players will no longer display. Block players will be unable to see your activity. And the above settings will also apply to characters added to your in-game blacklist. So it is pretty awesome how it sort of updates on the lodestone as well. That's really cool. So now we've got through the sort of sad side of things, but needed, honestly, and very cool that they're doing that. Event stuff. We've got Yokai Watch. Yokai Watch returns with a new framers kit shown featuring elements from Yokai Watch and its uh, sort of obviously design of the plate design. Yoshi P says, since we added portraits after our last uh, Yokai Watch collab, we asked if we can add some for the next, and we got the okay. So here's a new portrait, end quote. This event starts on Wednesday, the 24th of April, and runs up to the 25th of May, I believe. So that's pretty exciting if you want to take part in a Yokai Watch event. We don't know any other details yet. Probably there'll be a lodestone post with some more details. We don't know if we're adding new weapons or anything for the other jobs. No idea, but we do know there's a portrait section, so that's cool. There's also a second Moogle Treasure Trove event starting on the 14th of May until the 24th of June. 
Um, so that's something to be looking forward to, presumably with new rewards and a new Tombstone of Genesis. The media tour for Dawn Trail for content creators, influencers, and media starts on the 15th of May. Uh, this actually tours around the world, ending on the 30th of May. They're visiting Los Angeles in North America, as well as Berlin in Germany. So that's exciting for anybody who is attending that. And hopefully we get some really cool news out of that and footage and things. Hopefully some cool people get invited. I can't wait to see who and uh, cheer them along. There will be a return of a Dragon Quest X crossover event in the game on the 5th of June until the 20th of June. So if you want to do the Dragon Quest if you want to do the Dragon Quest 10 crossover, sorry it's early. Um I've been up a while. Then uh, then you can definitely do that, especially if you're an Xbox player and you want a wobbly hat. The jello hat. Definitely yeah, go and do that. Definitely it's it's a lot of fun. And get some puff puff whilst you're there. And that out of context sounds very bad. You will know what I mean when you do the quest. If you've never played Dragon Quest, That'll be even more out of context. Have fun with that. There are two scheduled live letters in the future, one for the 16th of May and one for the 14th of June. The 81st uh, letter, from a pro uh, letter from a producer live will focus on jobs. Maybe with a job trailer, Yoshi P says. Maybe not. Maybe. Who knows? On the 16th. So uh, there you go. The, uh, we're, we're going to be seeing a job trailer. That's going to be exciting. People are going to be picking apart the benchmark trailer and looking at all of the job actions and trying to figure out what they are. So uh, I can't wait to see who's right about what they guess. And uh, I can't wait to see a job trailer, honestly. There's going to be 48-hour maintenance for Dawn Trail because it's enormous. And then early access for Dawn Trail starts on the 28th of June. And uh, with that being said, the next segment is actually a realm resplendent with Warriors of Light. This is just player stats and information, uh, basically, to wrap up. There are over 30 million players worldwide now. Uh, Final Fantasy XIV has 240 accolades received worldwide, with 313 nominations. 88 etherites were reached in development, so that's how many are in the game, uh, compared to 2.0 when they had 27. This also does not include 7.0's etherites in the 88 as well, so 88 etherites, that's a lot. There are 325 duties available in the duty finder. This doesn't include PvP, gold saucer stuff, or content like Eureka. That's a lot of content. There are 159 hours of cutscenes. This also includes side quests as well. There are over 4,917 minutes of music in the game. Holy moly, with over 1,583 songs. Mazuyoshi Soken is truly a god, really is. That's a lot of music, I didn't realise. There are 16,096 tonnes, if the weight of one material was, what was it, a kilogram or something? Um, of material melded in the past year was equal to the total platinum reserves in the earth. Some of these stats are getting a bit far-fetched. 46,152 kilometers is the number of corks fired in, in terms of distance from bottles of Realm Reborn Red. Told you these are getting ridiculous. 54,350,656 liters is apparently in a, the amount of concoctions imbibed, so like potions and things, which is nearly more than the annual consumption of ketchup in the US, they say. Where are they getting these numbers? This is hilarious. Here's some stats then on um, when people who are apparently filling out a survey. I don't remember a survey. This might be Japan only. When they started playing the game, uh, we've got favorite amounts of players. Apparently the top one is the company Chocobo. That's based off stats, I presume. And then the SDS Fenrir and then the Fatter Cat. That's mostly because of convenience and when you get those mounts, presumably. And then favorite minions, apparently the Starbird, then Fat Cat, and then Lesser Panda. That's interesting. Favorite home points are Limsa Liminsa, unsurprisingly, Gridania, and then Old Charlian. Most formidable foe, although I'm not sure what stat this is behind, is apparently Hades, N Singer, and then Warrior of Light, which is, is an interesting one. Then we have uh, what Final Fantasy XIV means to you. So some word associations. First, the Japanese one. And then the English one. Personally, there are words on there, uh, but words aren't that aren't on there that should be. But um, yeah, 
And so merch time and announcements then is not too much. Uh, first, they showed this really, really interesting Bahamut and Meteon plate. Uh, they say this big one in the background isn't for sale, which is really sad. I'm not sure why they showed that then, because I want to buy the big one. The little ones are cute, I guess. Not my cup of tea. But uh, apparently those are of merch you can buy. There's a custom order photo book, Memories of Light, which is Japan only, where you get to print your own screenshots in a little book. Book of Memories, that's cute. Although it is Japan only. Wave 2 of the potato chips with the Final Fantasy XIV crossover with Kikeya. Wow. Kakea is going ahead, the chip company. With the deliciously hot flavor floor tank consome. Uh, sad. I don't know what that flavor is or whatever. Wave 2 of the Hydlin and Zodiac figure is available if you want to go and pre-order that. For your sexy emote with a free statue, that's available on all of the region store pages. I believe the shipping for that is October now for Wave 2. Listed on the screen if you want to get that. A planetarium show in Japan only featuring the tale of Eorzea's Divine and Celestial. There's some details on there if you're lucky enough to go to that. And Final Fantasy 16 Rising Tide DLC releases on the 18th of this month. Definitely worth checking out if you want more Final Fantasy 16 and Valisfea like I do. That game is amazing, go play it. And then finally, they're hiring a marketing planner and community planner in Japan for the Square Enix team. The QR codes are on screen. So if you're lucky enough to be living in Japan and you want to apply for a position at Square Enix, there you go, good luck. Don't, don't forget where you heard about this if you get chosen and you saw it on a video. Hi, bye. Um, so yeah, that was the letter from Reproducer Live Part 80. Quite a lengthy one, as you can probably imagine. There was a lot of talking, a lot of discussion about technical terms, and a lot of information about the blacklist features and protecting players. It's really interesting to see how much um, Square Enix are doing to provide a better play experience for everyone, especially now we have more players worldwide on more platforms than ever. Anyway, let me know what you're most excited for in Dawn Trail. For me, my personal picks were certainly the graphical update features and uh, seeing it in the game. That was mind-blowing to me. It's much better than seeing it in a picture, isn't it, side by side? So anyway, much love. Enjoy the rest of your day. More videos on the way from the benchmark and many other things, and I'll see you all next time. Bye-bye.